Hey everyone, it's Mark from Flight Sim School, and today we're going to be wrapping up our exploration of the TBM 850's different systems by looking at how to fly an arrival and an LPV RNAV approach with it into a busy airspace in the Boston area. We're picking up right where we left off and we're level at cruise at 19,000 feet right now and we're just about to jump onto the arrival procedure so let's get right into it. The TBM can really book it at cruise. Our ground speed right now is almost 290 knots, which in a single engine turboprop is kind of nuts. So before long, we're going to have to start descending. And I like to use the VNAV descent calculator in the GNS 530 to figure out when to start down. To help us figure out what numbers we can use for our descent calculation, we're going to quickly look at our arrival procedure. And first off, although we're flying a fast turboprop, there are still some restrictions that we need to respect in terms of procedures that we can actually fly with this airplane. The wounds too that we're looking at here fits the bill because in the conditions near the top it says that it's applicable to props landing at Logan International, which is definitely us. But if we had seen a restriction that said something like turbojets only, that means that we can only fly it with an airliner or a business jet, and we'd have to look for a different procedure that didn't say that instead. The first thing that popped out to me when I looked at this chart was the box that said that we should expect to cross wounds at 7,000 feet exactly, which is what I'll use for my VNAV calculation today. However, there is actually another restriction before that at Jewett. That one says we need to cross at 11,000 feet. So in theory, we should probably use that one to calculate our top of descent. But the great thing about a turboprop is that you can always cut more power to increase your descent rate without having to worry about shock cooling the engine. So we won't worry about it and we'll still use the 7,000 foot restriction. So now we have an idea what we're going to be doing. Let's head into the VNAV calculator to just figure out where our top of descent point is going to be. And I'll start by plugging in 7,000 feet into our target altitude. And then from there, I'll need to change my target position to be our wounds waypoint. So I'll just update that. And the last thing that we need to change is our vertical speed that we're planning on using. Just like with the climb, I like to use around 1500 to 2000 feet per minute to descend because it's a decent descent rate without being too aggressive either. So I'll confirm that. And now that it's done its little calculation, it's saying that we need to start down in just over eight minutes. So I'll meet you at the top of the descent point in just a second here. Unlike with modern glass cockpits like the G1000 and up, the VNAV calculation that we did is just that. It's only a calculation and we still need to do everything with regards to the descent by hand. So we're going to start that off today by setting our target altitude first, which is going to be 11,000 feet so it matches our restriction that we saw on the arrival chart. Now I'll switch into vertical speed mode and as we start to descend I'm going to adjust the power to maintain 220 knots indicated airspeed throughout the whole descent because we're going to be going into a busy airspace where there might be a lot of fast moving traffic. For a 1500 feet per minute descent that's going to equate out to around 80% on the torque but because we're likely going to have to level off for a little bit as we cross our altitude restrictions at 11,000 and 7,000 feet, I'm actually going to keep 850 mode on for now so I can always bring the power back in at any point that I need it to be able to maintain my airspeed. We're about two miles out from our first restriction at Jewett at 11,000 feet, so the plane's going to level off here for a couple of seconds until we cross that waypoint. So I'll actually bring the power back in a little bit here so that we can maintain our airspeed that we want. As soon as we've crossed that waypoint though, we can set up for the next segment of the arrival. And our target here is just like we saw in the briefing, it's 7,000 feet at the wounds. So I'll plug that in first and then we can go back into our 1500 feet per minute descent because we've crossed the waypoint now. 
that sets us up nicely to fly the rest of the arrival now but once we get to the end of it we're going to be jumping on to the approach for the rnav to runway four left and that also has a few step downs that we're going to have to do at vertical speed our navs are considered non-precision approaches, but there's varying levels of precision even within an RNAV approach from LPVs all the way to LNAVs. And which one you fly is mostly going to depend on what's available for a given approach because the GPS automatically picks the most precise one it can fly for you, which in this case is going to be the LPV approach. That's going to give us something that looks like a localizer to align ourselves with the runway and it'll also give us a glide slope that works pretty much exactly like an ILS approach. But there's one thing to be careful of and that's at the top of the chart you'll notice that it says the localizer is offset by 2 degrees. So that means that when our needle is centered in the HSI we're actually going to be off to the left of the runway a little bit. So we'll need to keep that in mind as we're flying the approach. We've got three step downs that we're going to need to do with vertical speed mode and that's going to bring us all the way to our final approach fix at which point we should pick up the glide path which will then take care of bringing us the rest of the way down to our decision height which is going to be 318 feet for today. In an RNAV approach with vertical guidance like we're going to be doing today, you're going to get something that looks like a glide slope, but it's actually a glide path. And the difference being that a glide path is a vertical profile that's calculated by the GPS, whereas a glide slope is actually using radio equipment that's on the ground to say if you're too high or too low. You'll hear me use both terms a little bit interchangeably throughout the video, mostly because in the HSI the symbols are going to say GS for glide slope, but it's definitely a glide path that we're using today. For now, no, there isn't much else that needs to be done other than to monitor our progress, watch our airspeed, as well as our altitude step downs on the arrival chart. So I'll meet you back towards the end of the arrival procedure. All right, we're level at 7,000 feet and we're coming up on the last waypoint of the arrival. I'm still maintaining our airspeed around 210 to 220 knots, but it's gonna be time to start thinking about configuring the airplane for the approach. We can set up our decision height now so we get that ping sound to warn us once we get down there. So we just need to put the switch into DH set to do that and then we can turn the dial right next to it until it's set to 320 feet which is the closest round number to our decision height of 318 feet on the chart. There's no radio frequency to load in for an RNAV approach and the only thing we need to make sure of is that we're in GPS mode on the HSI and the GPS itself as well and we want to be navving on the autopilot for now too. If we are flying into a mountainous area, there are a few features that you can use on board. First off, we've got our radar altimeter in the top right of the attitude indicator, which will come alive anytime you're below 2,500 feet above ground level. And on top of that, there's also the terrain inhibitor that you can disable if you want to silence all of the warnings that you're too close to the ground. We won't need either of those for today because we're landing in Boston, which is almost at sea level, but they're always useful to have around in case you need them. We're just going by our last waypoint of the arrival here, so we're heading to the approach waypoints now. And that first one is going to be Nunzo, and we can be at 6,000 feet for that one, so we can start our first step down of the approach. And one thing that I find difficult to do in this plane is using the vertical speed and the altitude knobs properly, especially if you're getting bounced around. It always ends up being a little bit of a struggle to get the click points right. We're going to reduce power to around 80% again to continue to maintain our airspeed during the descent. And this time we won't need 850 mode anymore so we can stow it. And like that we'll be ready to extend the flaps whenever we need them. The other thing we can do at this point is bring the RPM back up to full so we're prepared for landing and we'll also be ready for a go around if we end up screwing things up on the approach. We've got a few more last minute things that we can do here. We'll make sure our landing lights are on and pulsing so that we're highly visible to any other traffic. 
And last thing is we'll set our cabin pressure down to sea level because we're going to want to make sure that we've depressurized completely by the time we get down on the ground. Now that we've gone past the end of the arrival and we're on our way to the approach, I'm going to go into the procedures menu on the GPS. And from here, I'm going to choose activate approach to give the GPS the cue that we're going to be going to our first waypoint of the approach procedure. You'll notice our airspeed is still up around 200 knots. And for a normal approach, you'd want to be fully configured for landing by the time you get to the final approach fix. But in this type of situation where we're landing a smaller airplane into a busy, big international airport, ATC will usually ask you to keep your speed up as long as possible. So we're going to do that today. We still want to be as safe as possible as well though, so what I'll do is start configuring just outside of the final approach fix, and I'll keep the autopilot on until we're fully configured for landing, so our gear down and our flaps fully down, because like that, the autopilot will handle trimming the airplane out for us, and it'll be ready to go. Applying each of the step downs of the approach is exactly like we did previously with the arrival. The only difference is that these waypoints are a lot closer together. And since we're flying this approach a lot faster, we really have to be on the ball to drop the altitude right on time, switch into vertical speed mode, and then use vertical speed to get down to our next descent level. This is often what you might hear called the dive and drive technique, and there are arguments for and against it, with the alternative being to do a continuous descent on final approach, where you would calculate your flight path angle that's going to bring you directly to the decision height, and then you just fly that constant descent rate all the way down to that point. Both the dive and drive and the CDFA are a lot easier to do in a G1000 because of all of its extra automation. But you can let me know in the comments if you'd like to see how to calculate a CDFA by hand and I'll do a separate video on it because there's a fair bit of detail that needs to go into it. Okay, so we're just going by our last waypoint before the final approach fix, so we can set up our last step down to 1700 feet this time. And one important thing to keep an eye on at this point is the GPS mode in the bottom left. It's just swapped into LPV mode, so it's detected that we're doing an approach, and it's telling us that it will follow the localizer and descend along the glide slope, which we can see on the HSI. We're just below the glide slope intercept right now, which is normally where you would intercept it. And to make sure that the plane does descend on the glide slope once it does intercept, we're going to need to switch into approach mode on the GPS. And then from here, we just need to monitor our progress and watch what happens as we get there. I started slowing down a little bit more now too, but honestly, I think you could keep the speed up just a little bit longer as well, because the airplane does lose airspeed rather quickly. And I'm actually taking it a bit slow compared to what I've seen in some of steve -O's videos in the large airport approaches. But it's not a bad idea anyways until you're really comfortable with the airplane to take it a little bit slower. Otherwise, everything is looking good. We're coming up on our last level off before we descend to our decision height. We're still a bit below the glide pad, but that's all right. Our localizer centered, although one thing that's important to remember is that for this approach we're offset by 2 degrees from the runway, which isn't a huge deal today because we're flying in visual conditions, but we'll still need to keep that in mind as we descend here in just a couple of seconds. We're coming up on the final approach fix now, so let's go gear down, and that'll help to slow us down a whole lot more as well. And once that's stabilized, we can put the flaps to the takeoff position as well. And like this, all we've got left to do is go to full flaps. But we're going to hold off on that just a little bit longer because that's going to slow us down a lot as well. We're just about to intercept the glide slope on the HSI, so let's keep an eye on that. As we go by it any second now, it's going to start descending. There we go. So at this point, we can go to full flaps and that'll bring our airspeed down to a little bit over 100 to 110 knots. 
and we'll let the plane stabilize in its landing configuration for a couple more seconds so it can trim itself out properly for us. I really like doing it this way because it saves us from having to do manual trim changes after we turn the autopilot off, which on a busy approach like this one because of the offset, it's always a good thing because the last thing you want to be doing is fiddling with the trim at the same time as you're trying to get lined up with the runway. All right, at this point, we can turn the autopilot off so we can align ourselves with the runway and we should turn the yaw damper off now, too. I forgot to do it on this approach, so try not to make the same mistake as me here. And that's one place where having a checklist comes in useful. And I really should have double checked it on short final, but I didn't. I try to hold around 90 to 100 knots on short final and my goal is to be at 80 knots as I cross the threshold. So until then, I tend to keep the power in a fair bit because we're in the landing config with the gear down and the flaps down. The airplane just wants to slow down. As we cross over the threshold is where we're going to work our power out. And I know the landing speed for this airplane is supposed to be 80 knots, but I've always found at that speed that the airplane just wants to float on me. So I actually target to set down on the runway at around 75 knots, and I find that works pretty well. Once you're on the ground, I found that you can't quite get into reverse power until you've slowed down a fair bit with the brakes. But then from there, you should be able to get into beta and reverse power without any issue. I think this has to do with the way Black Square implemented the beta range, but I'm not 100% sure. So if you have any suggestions on how to improve that, feel free to put it in the comments. Otherwise, I hope you learned something useful on this flight and make sure to hit the like button if you did and subscribe as well to get more similar videos.